This morning's Old Testament reading is from Exodus, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of God. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the, Sinai, the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephaim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all that God had commanded. The people all responded together, we will do everything for the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Our scripture for today comes from John's Gospel. We read a, a familiar and somewhat strange uh, story this day of the cleansing of the temple. We read from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. Jesus also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus' disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a church a long time ago in a very distant place. So it was a church where religious ritual had come to replace relationship, where ministry had become something of a front for making a profit. This long ago church in a faraway place was supposed to represent God's very presence among his people. Instead, it came to be the place where people came to enrich the religious leaders until one day, until one day, when God, having broke into human history, having taken on flesh and come to dwell with us, dropped by that church, and busted the place up. This story about a God who really takes very seriously being worshiped for his sake alone worries pastors. 
This story worries me because what if one day Jesus showed up at the door to our sanctuary? What if one day when Kenny calls for the ushers to come forward for the offering, saying, will the ushers please come forward for the offering? The response is no. Because there's this guy here called Jesus and he's got a whip and he's come to bust the place up. What if one day Jesus were to come to our sanctuary to expose our religious pretensions, our complacency, if not our own hypocrisy? And Jesus would come through the doors and down the aisle, and he would be asking, each of you, what's in your wallet? And more importantly, why is it not being given to the poor? Or why are you spending so much time arguing amongst yourselves about musical preferences? Or which of the many ministries that you could be doing but aren't? And Jesus would come forward and he would begin to look at me and he would say, what are you telling these people? And I would say, well, Jesus, I preached on the cleansing of the temple on March 15, 2015, right after I got back from my vacation. And we would all know that pretension and complacency and hypocrisy is shared. This strange and disturbing story that we read today of a, a church from long ago and far away worries me, should worry all of us, because it's our story too. And so we read in verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and he found money changers sitting at their tables. Now, when we retell this story, we tend to imbue it with a sense of, of surprise or discovery that Jesus came into the temple and he stumbled on this scene that he wasn't expecting. This scene of chaos with all of these animals filling the courts of the Gentiles and the, the chaos and the chatter and the noise and the dust and the smell and all of that. And he's surprised somehow by what he finds in the temple. And that retelling of the story would be wrong. Because Jesus knew exactly what he was going to find when he came to the temple for the Passover festival. Jews were required to come for the main festivals in Jerusalem each year for Passover and for Shavuot and for Sukkot. And it was always the same, had always been the same. He knew and everyone knew what the worship service order of the day was going to be, just like at 9 o'clock, we know we're going to show up and have three praise songs and a sermon, and at 11 we get three hymns and a sermon. The Jews, when they came to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, knew what the worship service order of the day was. It involved bringing an animal for sacrifice, but you could not bring an animal from home unless you want to take the risk that it would be rejected by the temple inspectors as being unblemished in some way. And so you came to the temple and you purchased an animal outside the gate 
from the people who had animals for sale that were supposedly unblemished and appropriate for sacrifice. And you couldn't use the money you brought from home because the money that was used had the picture of the emperor on it, had a graven image, and it was not acceptable for purchases in the temple. So you had to exchange your money at a very significant exchange rate and purchase the more expensive animal at the gate because what happens when you're a captive audience for purchases is called price gouging. It's not something that we have invented for after a hurricane. And so you would purchase this animal with the money that you've exchanged and then you would go into the next court with your animal and it would be re-inspected and just like when you're going through airport security you know that a certain number of people are going to be pulled aside for that random search a certain percentage of animals are not going to pass the inspection that they are in fact appropriate for sacrifice despite the fact that you just bought it outside the gate and now you're stuck and you buy another animal for sacrifice this is what people knew to expect, and everyone knew that these purchases, this price gouging, and the rate exchanges were disproportionately felt by the poor. Just like we all know that we live in a society where because basic necessities all cost the same for all of us, the poor are disproportionately burdened by the purchase of those necessities. But knowing something and saying or doing something about it are two very different things. Jesus, in our story, he actually says and does something about this burden that is being placed on these people. Jesus making a whip of cords, drove all of the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Now, just like when we retell the story, we kind of imbue it with this sense of surprise or discovery of the scene. We also, in our retelling of this story, begin to experience some discomfort with the level of violence and anger that we realize that Jesus is expressing. There is a level of, of intentionality and deliberateness to what Jesus does that kind of kind of unnerves us a little bit. He takes the time to construct this whip, it making a whip out of cords. And he doesn't just make a symbolic statement of pushing one cow out of the way or letting one dove or pigeon fly off. He drives them all out of the temple. That's a lot of animals. He's doing this for a while, long enough so that everybody is involved. And he doesn't just take some of the coins and say, listen, this is wrong, you shouldn't do this. Of course, all the coins out, all the money changers, and overturns all their tables. Now, I like to watch crime shows on TV. And what Jesus does in this story is what you would call in a crime show, overkill. He, he does more than really is necessary to make his statement. And we're uncomfortable with that. This is a Jesus that, that we don't want or desire or feel like we need. This, this is a Jesus that we don't expect. This is not the Jesus that we have flattened into flannel so that we can put him on the flannel board so that he doesn't offend anyone. This is not the Jesus that we have domesticated into being a good guy that we can hang out with when we feel like it on our own terms. 
this is a very different Jesus. This is a, a, a Jesus who says that we worship a holy God who wants, no, who expects, who demands, who demands true worship. And he doesn't just dislike the things that get in the way of that worship. He hates them with a level of, of violence that, that really gets our attention in this story. But can you blame Jesus? Can you blame him for having that? Think about it. God has liberated his people, released them from bondage, from their slavery in Egypt, and has established the Passover as the holiest of holidays. And people are called to come and celebrate and commemorate that release from their slavery, and what do the religious leaders do? They jack up the rates in Jerusalem as if it was the site for the Super Bowl. Can you blame Jesus for his anger? What, what the religious leaders were doing was not illegal, it was at least immoral, but Jesus doesn't say, stop abusing a good system. He says, stop the system. He says, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Verse 18, the Jews said to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? What sign can you show us for doing this? There's no indication in the text that anyone stepped in or tried to prevent Jesus from doing or saying what he did in this prolonged scene of, of clearly um, anger and violence. And there, there would have been many, many pilgrims there for the festival of Passover. And more guards than usual set up so that any little tiny bit of unrest would not spill over into the streets and cause a great deal of violence. And yet the religious authorities, whose livelihood has just been dumped on the ground or shushed out the door, they show remarkable restraint as all of this is going on. And at the end of it, they ask Jesus, what sign do you have? What, what sign of your authority to do and say what you have just done and said. They're asking Jesus, do you have a license to carry the weapon that you just lobbed into the middle of our religious system? Do you have a license to carry that weapon? And Jesus says, yes. He says, yes. Yes, I do. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. If mouths weren't already gaping by now, they were when he said that. The temple had stood for centuries, a magnificent structure that was being renovated to be even more magnificent by Herod to the tune of an 80-year reconstruction project that would have involved perhaps as many as 10 or more thousand workers. Certainly dwarfs what they're gonna be doing to I-4. And the religious authorities have just heard from Jesus a claim that he has the authority to condemn the temple. Tear it down. You don't need it anymore. 
I, Jesus says, I'm going to be the temple connecting you with God. Pilgrims will no longer have to come to Jerusalem in order to enter into the holy presence of God. No longer will they have to give money in order to secure that kind of access to God. Jesus says, it's not about religion, rituals, and rules, and temples. It's about relationship. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. And the resurrection will be the ultimate proof of Jesus' authority. He says, wait till you kill me. And I am raised up after three days, and then you will have the sign of my authority to do and say what I just did. That will be your sign. We read in verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that Jesus had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We, today, in the retelling of this story, know, as the disciples did, that we have the sign. If you are looking for a sign, this is it. The ground of our hope is never that we will get it right, either individually or as a church, through some religious practice, some religious ritual. The ground of our hope is that there is someone who knows us, someone who knows us and who came to be for us willingly sacrificing himself in our place and for our sake. Jesus is that way of connecting with God. That is the relationship that leads to life.